got a Bible with you, uh, Acts 2 is where we will be this morning. But if you don't have a Bible with you, we'll have all the verses here on the screens, and you can just follow along with us there. Uh, back in college, I got really into watching mixed martial arts. If you're not familiar with um, what that is, if you've seen like the UFC on TV with the guys in the octagon cage fighting, um, th- that's mixed martial arts. And so back in college, me and my buddies, uh, we would always hang out. We would go get wings and watch the fights together whenever they were on. And then at some point, I had the terribly misguided idea that it would be fun to begin training to be a mixed martial arts fighter. Um, I don't know where this idea came from. I blame it on being young and dumb. And uh, if you didn't know, science has now confirmed that the, the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that helps limit dumb, impulsive decisions, is not fully formed until you're 25. And so I was still young and dumb. My brain had not fully formed yet. So I'm like, yeah, let's become a cage fighter. That sounds like a great plan. So around that time, um, I met a guy at church named Nathan. Nathan had been doing some form of martial arts literally his entire life. And at this point, he was training for mixed martial arts. So we talked, and he's like, yeah, man, come with me to my gym, and, and, and you, know, you can start training there, and we'll train together. So I did. I went and started training with Nathan at his gym. And, and a few weeks in, I started to feel a lot more confident in my abilities than I should have. So I say, hey, Nathan, I, I'm feeling pretty good. I think I'm ready to go. You know, what do you think about you and I getting together? We'll we'll come to the gym, and we'll have like a practice fight. We'll just kind of go like 75, 80% to to see where I'm at. Nathan looks at me. He laughs, and he says, you want to fight me? Now, Now, here's a free tip for you. This has nothing to do with the sermon. This is just free. But if you ever tell somebody you want to fight them, and they respond by laughing at you, abort mission. Like, that's a bad sign. That means it's not going to go well for you. But, but I say, no, Nathan, like, it's good to go. I want to see where I'm at. Let's, let's get together. Now, again, this was terribly misguided because Nathan had been doing this his entire life. I've been doing this for about three weeks. But the thing I thought that I had going for me was that Nathan was a tiny little dude. I, I was like five inches taller than him. I was probably like 50 pounds heavier than him. He is a little dude. So I'm like, of course he's more skilled than me. Uh, of course he, he's better than me, but I'll just be able to throw my weight around. I'll be able to just tackle him, take him to the ground, and rough him up a little bit. I thought that's what was going to happen. So the day comes, and uh, Christy, my now wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, she's there. All of her roommates are there. So I'm like, man, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to show my new girlfriend and all of her friends how awesome I am. They're going to see what a tough guy I am. This is going to be great. So we get started. You know, I try to go through with my plan of getting close to Nathan, tackling him, taking him to the ground. But every time I try to get near him, he's too quick and he backs away. And then in the middle of all that, he's just kind of toying around with me. Every time I'll try to get close to him, he'll just kind of throw a jab, punch me right in my nose, which is awful. Right? And, and then eventually he just kind of gets bored. He gets tired of messing around with me. He takes me down to the ground. Somehow he gets me flat on my stomach, and about that time, as he's sitting on top of me, pummeling me in the head, I realize finally, I am a fool. I realize, what in the world have I done? I realize that I have gotten myself way over my head, that I was completely overwhelmed with this situation that I was in. And I, have you guys ever been in a situation like that? Not, not a situation, hopefully, where you're getting beat up in front of your girlfriend by somebody half your size, but I, I mean a situation where you feel completely overwhelmed, right? Have you ever been there? In a situation where you realize you are completely in over your head. All right, last week, if you missed us, uh, we started this new series called How We Change the World, and what we saw last week was that God's plan is to use His church to transform and change the world. And those of us who are followers of Jesus and who are part of the church, what that means is that by extension, God's plan is to use us, right? It's to use you and I to change the world. But I don't know about you guys, but I know for me personally, when I think about the fact that God has called me and God has tasked me with being part of His plan to change the world, I feel completely overwhelmed. But I feel like I am in way over my head. I don't feel like I am anywhere near equipped 
to be able to do something like that. I don't even know where to start. But here's the good news that we're going to see this morning. God does not expect you and I as part of the church, God does not expect us to change the world through our own power. Right? God's not up in heaven thinking, man, look at them. They're so smart. They're so talented. They're so creative. They're so innovative. Man, they can really change the world. No, no. God doesn't expect us to change the world through our power. We're going to see this morning that God's plan is to change the world through His power working in us and through us. So again, we're going to be in Acts 2 this morning. Last week in Acts 1, we saw kind of this final farewell between Jesus and His disciples where Jesus brings His followers together. And He says, hey guys, what you are called to do is you are called to go out and change the world, but the way I'm telling you to change the world is simply by going and telling the world about me. By going out and telling the world about what I have accomplished, how I have defeated sin and death through my death and resurrection. Jesus says, go do that and don't worry. I'm going to send you the power for you to be able to do that. So Jesus tells them that, then he ascends to heaven. A few days later, the disciples are hanging out in a house together waiting to see what's going to happen. And this is what happens in Acts 2, verse 1. It says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability So again, what's going on is the disciples are hanging out together, and out of nowhere, they are suddenly filled with the Holy Spirit. They are filled with the very Spirit and the power and the presence of God. They are now filled with the power that Jesus promised them would come in Acts chapter 1. And then as evidence of this, they begin speaking in all of these other languages. Now, This is obviously such a crazy, strange, and bizarre story. But here's what's going on. They're in Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem at this time, there is this Jewish celebration called Pentecost that's going on. And so there are Jewish people from all over the world who had traveled to Jerusalem for this festival, for this celebration. So there are people from all of these distant lands who speak all of these different languages who are now in Jerusalem. And so when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples, because of all the commotion, because of this, what it tells us, sounded like a roaring mighty windstorm, because of all this, all these people are like, what's going on? What's the deal? Where's all this noise coming from? So they go to the house where the disciples are to find out what's going on. And what happens is, as everybody comes and arrives at this house, all these people from all these distant lands who speak all these distant languages, what happens when they get there is they are actually hearing the disciples speak in their own native languages. And so Peter looks out, Peter, one of the followers of Jesus, he looks out, he sees what is going on, and he sees this as an opportunity to do what Jesus told them to do in Acts chapter 1. Because remember, Jesus said, hey, go to the ends of the earth and tell people about me. Peter looks out at this crowd that's forming, and he literally sees people who come from the ends of the earth. And not only that, but but he realizes that somehow God is working some miracle where all these people from the ends of the earth who speak all sorts of different languages are being able to understand what they are saying in their own native languages. And so Peter realizes, hey, this is an opportunity to do what Jesus just told us to do. We need to get up and tell these people about Jesus. And so Peter does just that. Let me read you just a little bit of what Peter says to them. Verse 22, Peter says, People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross, and you killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in his grip. And then in verse 36, Peter says, 
So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. So Peter and the other disciples, they receive the Holy Spirit. And when they receive the Holy Spirit, the first thing that Peter does is get up and proclaim the good news of Jesus. He receives the Holy Spirit, and immediately he gets up and he proclaims Jesus. And then look at what happens as a result in verse 41. It says, Then those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. So first, the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples as Jesus promised them would happen. And then because of that, Peter gets up and proclaims the gospel. He proclaims the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. And then immediately, 3,000 people come to faith in Christ. 3,000 people are saved. The world literally in that moment begins to shift and change. So here, if you're taking notes, is kind of the big idea that we see in this passage. Here's what we learn in Acts 2 about how we, as Garden Oaks Baptist Church, can change the world. What we learn is that we, you and I, we are responsible for proclaiming Jesus. That's our responsibility. We are responsible for proclaiming Jesus. The Holy Spirit is responsible for the results. Okay, you and I who are followers of Jesus, we have this responsibility that Jesus has given us to proclaim the good news of his death and resurrection. We have been given that responsibility through the Great Commission. But what we see in this passage is that we are not responsible for the results. The Holy Spirit is. So you and I, we proclaim Christ. Right? That's our job. That's the task that Jesus has given us. But what we've got to understand is that you and I, we can't convict a person's heart of their sin. Right? Some of you have tried this. You've realized this. That's above your pay grade, right? We can't convince somebody to put their faith and their hope in Jesus. We can't do that. We don't have the power in us to do that. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Right? Jesus said that clearly in John 16, 8. He said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin. How the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. And again, if you're a Christian, you've personally experienced this miracle in your own life, haven't you? You experienced that when you came to faith in Christ. It doesn't matter if you came to faith in Christ when you were young or when you were older. If you've put your faith and your hope and trust in Jesus, you experienced that. Because before you trusted Jesus to save you, you were just going through life, and you you didn't spend time thinking about your sin. You you may have thought about right or wrong or good or bad in kind of those terms, but you didn't think about the fact that you were a condemned sinner who was going to stand one day in judgment before a perfect, righteous, holy God. That That wasn't on your mind. That wasn't a concern for you. You didn't go through your life thinking about that. But then, for some, either slowly over time or for others, in a moment, you were suddenly made aware of your sin. Right? You suddenly felt the weight. You felt the gravity of your sin. You realized that one day you were going to stand before the creator of the universe and give an account for your life. You felt the weight of that. What, what was that? How did you go from not caring at all about that to feeling the weight of your sin? It's the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit doing what the Holy Spirit does. And so we see an example of that here in Acts 2, that it's our job to proclaim Jesus. That's what you and I are responsible for. It's God's job through the Holy Spirit to stir someone's heart so that they respond to the gospel. Right, And so I say that we've got to be careful that we don't read this story in Acts 2 and we don't fall into this trap of thinking, man, 3,000 people came to Christ and got saved this day because Peter was awesome. Right? We've got to be careful we don't think the reason 3,000 people got saved was because Peter was such a great, gifted, and talented communicator and he just preached this amazing service. No, that's not what happened. Remember, this is the same Peter who literally a month before this 
was denying that he even knew Jesus. That's the same dude. Right? This is Peter, who was not a Bible scholar. He was a fisherman by trade. Right? What's interesting is that in this day when a rabbi, which is what Jesus was in part, when a rabbi would go and choose the disciples that were going to follow them, what a rabbi would typically do is they would go down to the synagogues, they would go down to the Jewish schools, and they would select by hand the best of the best of the best. They would find the students who were the most well-spoken, the students who had more Old Testament memorized than the others, the students who had the best grades. They would look at the students who were head and shoulders above the rest, and they'd say, hey, you've got what it takes. And they would say, come and follow me. But see, the students who weren't very well spoken, the students who didn't really know the Old Testament that well, the students who didn't get good grades, the rabbis would look at them and say, go learn your father's trade. Which was basically a, a kind of nice, politically correct way of saying, hey, you don't have what it takes to be my disciple, you better go learn the family business because that's all you'll ever measure up to. Right? That was the process of how rabbis chose disciples in this day. So think back to early in Jesus' ministry when he's going around and he's choosing the disciples. What is Peter doing when Jesus finds him? He's fishing. And who is Peter fishing with? His family. Peter is working in the family business, which means that all the other rabbis when Peter was younger look at Peter and said, Peter, you don't have what it takes. You're not good enough to be one of my disciples. You better go learn to do whatever your dad does to make a living because that's all you'll ever be. Peter was the leftovers. He was the reject. He was the last one picked. Right, Y'all remember back in elementary school at recess when a kickball game would break out? You remember that terrible feeling when you weren't one of the captains and you had to get in that line and you're just sitting there hoping and praying and saying, please, God, don't let me be the last one picked. But Peter was the last one picked. And that's the kind of disciples that Jesus chose to be on his team. The ones who were the rejects, the ones who were the leftovers, the ones who all the other rabbis looked at and said, you are not good enough to be my follower. That's who Jesus looked at and said, hey, I'm going to use you to change the world. So listen, don't, don't ever believe this lie that, that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, that you're not talented enough for God to use to change the world. 3,000 people didn't come to faith in Jesus at Pentecost because Peter was awesome. 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus simply because Peter was faithful in proclaiming Jesus and the Holy Spirit showed up. That's what happened in Acts too. See, it, it's our job, it's our responsibility to proclaim the good news of Jesus. The result of whether people accept or reject that good news, that's up to their own free will and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's not our responsibility what happens, it's our responsibility to proclaim. So this has obvious, I think, implications for us both individually as followers of Jesus, but also for us communally and collectively as a church family. First of all, individually, this reminds us that if you're a follower of Jesus, you have this same Holy Spirit that the disciples received in Acts 2. This very same Holy Spirit lives in you and empowers you to proclaim the message of Jesus. Look at verse 17 of Acts 2. Look at what Peter says. He says, in these last days, God says, I will pour my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike. Peter here, he quotes the Old Testament prophet of Joel and he says that in these days, God is going to empower all of his people with the Holy Spirit. That young and old, male and female, all of God's people will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So again, don't miss this. This is so important. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have put your faith and your hope and your trust in Jesus' death and resurrection, 
you have the Holy Spirit living within you. And the Holy Spirit is empowering you to proclaim the message of Jesus. Listen, I, I don't care if you're just a student and you think you're too young to do anything of value. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can empower you to change the world. I, I don't care if you think you're too old to make a difference. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. You have everything you need to be empowered to make a difference and change the world. Listen, I think one of the terrible, awful things in our culture today is, is that sometimes there is this message that is communicated in our culture that, that once you get past a certain age, you don't really have anything of value to offer society anymore. But listen to me. According to God's word, it doesn't matter if you're 105 years old and you're watching at home because you're homebound and you require 24-7 around-the-clock care. If there is still breath in your lungs, God still has a plan for you. If you're still here, God is not done with you. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you have this same Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you to empower you to accomplish that plan and that purpose. And that plan and purpose is to proclaim the good news of Jesus in your little corner of the world. See, we can retire from our careers, but biblically speaking, we never retire from the Great Commission. Right? We never retire from the mission of God. We never graduate from proclaiming the message and the good news of Jesus. And so again, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, young or old, male or female, I don't care, you have the same Holy Spirit that empowered these disciples in Acts 2. And that Holy Spirit is empowering you to fulfill your responsibility of proclaiming the good news of Jesus. But again, what happens with that proclamation, that's out of our control. That's beyond our pay grade. That's in God's hands. So in our personal lives, we must make sure that we are doing our job of proclaiming Jesus, and then we trust the Holy Spirit to bear fruit from our effort. But again, this also has incredible implications for us as a church family. This has implications for us communally as Garden Oaks Baptist Church. Right? It's, it's no secret if you've been around here, and you know, I'm not really one to beat around the bush, that, that there have been some difficult days that we have been through as a church family. Right? That it's been some tough years here. And when I look at the trends that we are in the middle of, when, when I see how we have been a church that has been in decline for years, and I'm not even really worried about, you know, a decline in worship attendance or a decline in giving. You know, those things are important and all that. But the, the most troubling thing I see is when I look at our baptism numbers, there are week times where we go an entire year as a church family without baptizing somebody. Right? Where it's not rare, where we will go an entire year without seeing somebody come to faith in Christ. We'll go an entire year without accomplishing the Great Commission. And remember, like we said last week, the church exists to glorify God by accomplishing the mission of God, which is the Great Commission. We exist, we are here, we are gathered to glorify God by accomplishing the Great Commission. And so if we are a church that is not faithfully accomplishing the Great Commission, what that means is that we are robbing God of the glory that He deserves and demands. And so that, that should trouble us. That should cause us to step back and say, well, what do we need to do about that? But as your new pastor, what I am so clearly and soberly reminded of here when I read Acts 2 is that I cannot turn this church around. And, and I hope and pray that that's not a shock to you. I hope you realize that. 
I hope and pray that you don't expect that I can come in here with some new, fresh, innovative, creative ideas and preach some sermons and do a couple things and turn this place around because I can't do that. I do not have the power within me to do that. The only thing that can turn this church around, the only thing that can make it where once again, like we have in the past, we as Garden Oaks Baptist Church can be this place that is a light in this community, be a place that is accomplishing the Great Commission, that can be a place that is reaching our community with the good news of Jesus. The only thing that can make that happen is God sending the power of His Holy Spirit to move mightily among us. That's the only hope we have. But here's what I believe with all my heart that we also see here in Acts 2. It's that if we will be a people who prioritize the Great Commission like we talked about last week, and we will be a people who faithfully proclaim the good news of Jesus, if we do that, I believe with all my heart, the Holy Spirit will begin to move powerfully once again in and through this place. Because Acts 2 shows us that when Jesus is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit moves. See, if here at Garden Oaks, if what we are about is making a name for ourselves, if our desire is to make Garden Oaks Baptist Church famous, if my desire is to create a platform and a name for me, if that's what we're about, God's not going to honor that. And the Holy Spirit is not going to have any part of that. But if here at Garden Bo Oaks Back to Church, if we are all about making the name of Jesus famous, if we're all about lifting Jesus' name high as the name that is above every other name, if we are about boldly and enthusiastically and unashamedly proclaiming Jesus to our community, if that's what we are about, then and only then, God will spend the power and presence of His Holy Spirit to move powerfully and mightily among us once again. And then God will begin again to use Garden Oaks Baptist Church to change the world. Let me pray for us.